G'day and welcome to the Dawnbringers preview for book four, The Mad King Rises. Um, we have an early copy. Uh, I don't have the physical one in front of me. It's still being shipped. I do have electronic ones. So you'll either have to trust me that I have the book or I'm going to make up a bunch of rules and then when you get it, it's completely different. I will let you decide if you trust me enough. Uh, but I am joined by someone who is the chosen of Nagash, the Mortark of Rules, someone who's going to keep me honest when it comes to collecting the bone tithe. That is, that is Madigan Mason. I'm going to laugh myself. That's how ridiculous I sound. Um, I'm here with Madigan Mason, who is very well known. Um, she is an incredible person who helps so many people with the rules, an absolute star when it comes to death, um, has done incredibly well. I think you went, did you go four and one or you, you basically ruled the world when you went to Old Town Throwdown. I know you'll be supporting um, the LVO as well. So um, I thought if anyone could help me understand Grand Alliance death, because this is not just a particular video about Soul Blight or about um, Osiak Bone Reapers. There's actually something a little bit for everyone when it comes to death. So um, Madigan, welcome. I'm going to keep refer you to Maddie now moving forward. But welcome, g'day, and welcome back, actually. You were uh, here with us previously. Yeah. Uh, hi. It's great to be here. I'm super excited for this book. It's basically everything I could want in a splat book. Death, death, and more death. So I'm pumped. It's an interesting book, um, very different. Um, the Dawnbringers uh, books, if you're unfamiliar with them, um, so they're a series of, I guess, narrative campaigns where they have added um, story to help evolve the narrative for Age of Sigma to maybe to fourth edition or to at least the next big story arc. Uh, 40K had like Arcs of Omen. We've had Broken Realms in the past. There's been a bunch of these historically. Uh, this is the, the latest one. And as Madigan's already mentioned, it is all about death. Very exciting. Very, uh, I thought I'd just open up the floor, but I, I'll, I'll just keep talking. Uh, and <laughs> it, it's exciting, right? Like, like, it, look, it's interesting. I probably shouldn't say exciting. It's not like the, the next uh, KO, destroy everybody, uh, army of renown is not in here. Uh, but it is certainly an interesting one and one that death fun. players will appreciate. It's a very fluffy, fluffy one. Yeah, so hopefully we will give you uh, a good idea of this is for you if you want to buy it. Um, if you do want to buy it, by the way, Games Workshop did send it to me in advance, so I do have the book. Uh, I come at no cost, and if you do want to support the channel and you're thinking about buying it, uh, consider my partners, either Warpfire Minis in the USA or Element Games. Uh, there is a link down below, and uh, a bit of the proceeds go to the channel. A couple of exciting things coming in 2024 that this will all help towards, and Let's get into this, Maddie. Let's let's talk a little bit about death and let's talk a little bit about this particular book. So we have the Mad King. Uh, it is 96 pages, um, 42 pages of law. There's 14 pages of triumph and treachery. Um, Maddie, what is that for people who are unfamiliar with triumph and treachery? So triumph and treachery is a four player or three player sometimes, but all the ones in here are four player, I believe. Uh, and it's a multiplayer format. Um, it's a free for all. So some of you might be familiar with like 2v2 doubles, but this is four players all at it for themselves. Um, I'm really excited that it's in here because I really enjoy when Games Workshop focuses on other things besides just match play. So I love seeing, you know, fluffy, different ways to play, different formats um, in spot books like this. So I'm definitely going to play this. There's some really interesting rules, um, and it's good fun. Like you know, on a Friday night, I'll be with my friends at the, yeah, get at the your game store. Together. Yeah, like we all bring a thousand points, or you know, you bring you two thousand points, and you know, there's a lot of fun, right? Because you start with an ally, and then you backstab them a little later, and there's a, there's a fun, or, or you can all gang up on people. It's it's a it is a lot of fun. Yeah. There's also um, 14 pages of Path to Glory. By the way, there's an incredible uh, battle plan I should acknowledge there. It says War of the Mortarks, a lot of fun. So, um, and it, it, this book is all about the Mortarks and all about death. Um, there is a new unit, the Fang of New Lamia, Sek is it Sekar? Um, Sekar. You've, all, 
You've also got a new army of renown. So Soul Black Grave Lords, there is a new way to structure your force. Um, and there are new six new regiments of renown. So if you are a death player looking to expand your force or maybe start a collection into a different part of death, uh, there is certainly a way through the regiments of renown. Uh, and they're all based around one of the Mortarks each. And we will go through all of this, by the way. Well, at least the match play stuff, we'll go through this um, in today's video. Anything you'd want to comment here, Maddie, or should I give a little bit of a preview on the story? Look at give me, two plus, two, two plus tough coach. Yeah, I'm the, the, like big, the big, the big, the big, the big law guy. So, so I don't want to spell, spoil the story because I do want you to go and buy this book if it, if you you do like the story. Half of the story is the the book, forty two pages out of the ninety six, so just under fifty percent. But to give you the, the the high level elevator pitch, right? So. Um, the last book was all about destruction, and it was about the Dawnbringers, the, the cities of Sigma, and they are on a crusade, basically, uh, the twin-tailed crusade, one being based on Gairam, one being based by Akshi. So there are two forces going out to the world to expand on behalf of Sigma and, and create some new cities and, and reclaim the realms from all the baddies. That's basically the high-level story. So they've just kind of defeated or run away or they've, 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 they've broken past destruction. And now this book is all about running into basically death. So um, you first, when you go to Gairan, you find part of the, um, the crusade um, is finishing up with the cruel boys. They're kind of moving forward and they run into a big Ossiarch Empire uh, wall, a huge bone tied wall. And uh, there is a liege on top, and he basically has a fun interaction where um, he says to this crusade, you either can turn around and build your city, and I will not make you pay bone tithe for a century, or you can basically die. That's basically, he's like, you got two choices, die or pay the tithe later, but I'll give you a little bit of charity. And... Um, there's a few people in this in this crusade who hate death and there's a bit of a squabble on like what to do do we trust the liege you know we've heard stories of the liege um turning their back on people and breaking their rules or do we do we trust him basically the liege is like what are you guys doing you are taking too long and calls the uh more tech crawlers to just shoot at them like this just shoots at them and uh what's fascinating is that this wall isn't as strong as it appears because it is based around death magic, but they're in the realm of life. Gairan is the realm of life. So what happens is um, basically a combination between um, Alariel's life magic has made it really weak. Um, there is a bit of like the, the rite of passage happening, um, you know, Alariel's magic. You've had the support of the Hallowed Knights come in to kind of help a little bit. And eventually parts of the war crash and they, they go through, they, they continue their adventure, no major fight. And then, you know, fast forward a little bit, they're, they're going through this area called um, the Peak of the Neck, um, and they find a fortress. Um, Maddie, who do you think might be in a fortress, this random random fortress in the middle of Gairan? Who possibly could be there? We've got vampires. We've got, you know, mordants. We've got abhorrents. Well, it's interesting Plenty you say them. that. Yeah, there is plenty of options. It's interesting because um, there's this un there's this compelling reason for the cities to go and check out this this fortress. They're like, I don't know why I want to go there, but I have this like desire to to go oh. go check out this citadel. Yeah, they're drawn to it. Um, so a part of the part of the force goes and checks it out. So the Lord Arcanum is it Astria Soulblight? I think that's whatever her name is. Soulblight. Um, yeah. Yeah, Solbright and, and a few friends go and go check out this fortress. And lo and behold, it is um, the Fleck, the Fleck de Corps. Um, and what's fascinating is that they are invited as guests. They're not actually enemies. They're going, come, come, come to the grand feast of the, the Summer King. And um, inside, we also find the new character, Sector. Um, and basically, long story short, it leads into a battle and a bit of a flurry when um, our new vampire friend corrupts one of the, um, the Cities of Sigma handgunner people, um, the Bombardier, uh, to shoot 
uh, at the Summer King with a silver bullet with a, uh, a you know, a, a psychological suggestion um, to trigger something. So, um, and then um, a scrap happens and, you know, some people flee and yada, yada, yada. Then on the other side of the coin, you have actually where, um, where there's a little bit of a fight, a little bit of a scrap initially between um, the V not V Cross, um, the Avangori and the Crimson Court, and then there's a little bit of a, a, a I guess, a scrap. And um, as the Akshi city is kind of crusading through Akshi, um, they eventually get into a fight with the Castelli, and there's an interesting, interesting fight and story between the Pontifex Flagellants and that part of the Crusade versus like necromancer and coven thrones and zombies and direwolves and uh, a massive scrap because they find like a, a ruined city they're thinking about settling there but it was like a the crux or the bones of the uh, a, a crimson keep um or at least it was and then it like yeeted out the, so super fascinating that's like the high level story there's some really good stuff in there um and hey i'm not really the biggest narrative person i hope how, how did i go how did i go with the with the narrative storytelling it's a very compelling. It really right, makes well, me want to read it. <laughs> it actually was a lot of fun. Like, you know, credit, credit aside. It I, sounds I like a fun story, yeah. There was a lot of fun stories. I'm rooting like, for death, of course. Well, it's funny because, like, in the Pontifex story, I think there's, like, coven thrones, like, just flying around the sky, terrorizing. The, the poor old Pontifex has to, like, you know, power up and try to turn the wheel and, you know, save the people because... It was getting pretty dire, but I actually found it really fascinating. Even before that part, they talk about and um, set up this fight between the Avangori and the Castelli. I didn't realize there was like such, um, you know, rivalry between Lucavi and um, the Castelli. Black guys made a lot of enemies. Uh, Guriza too, uh, of the OBR. Um, there's a big spat between them mentioned in the Soulblight Battle Tome. Okay. All right. Well, I've, I've learned a few things and uh, got me a little bit excited. But what we should talk about is maybe the first thing, which is um, Sektar, the uh, the fangs of New Lamia. So this is a brand new model to Soul Black Grave Lords. Um, she is 160 points, uh, movement of six, uh, save of four plus, bravery 10, seven wounds, two weapon profiles, one being the New Lamia Glaive, one being the God Husk Fangs. Uh, the God Hust Fangs are the weapon profile of the snake. So it's it's uh, the companion mount um, rule there. She's a double caster, double unbinder, and there's some interesting rules. There's a once per battle ability where you can do some damage um, with a 2d6 basically subtracted or, you know, compare it to the movement characteristic of, of enemies within six inches. Um, there is a um, an ability that you only score hits on an unmodified five or a six. But when you use that uh, time swallower more, the 2d6 people take damage, um, you then lose the um, the serpentine agility. So a little bit of a, do I use this? Do I keep it? Uh, and then there's a spell, which is uh, range of six. Uh, so casting value of six, range 18. Uh, if successfully cast, pick an enemy unit. Uh, vis obviously visible until your next hero phase. Uh, that unit cannot be picked. Uh, this That unit cannot pick this unit or friendly units wholly within six of this unit to be the target of a spell prayer abilities or shooting attacks. Uh, Sekhar is unique. Uh, it is a single model, 160 points, and is also keyword key locked to the Legion of Blood. So I've gone a very high level overview. Definitely didn't go into all of the weeds. You can read it on the screen. Maddie, what's your first impressions? 160 point, vampire, seven wounds, four up save, move of six, Interesting rules, I would say, maybe. Yeah, the most directly comparable unit is the standard vampire lord. Um, and I find it hard to justify her, um, especially this season. They're about the same points. Vampire lords are 10 points less. Um, she does a little bit more damage, but not really meaningfully so. Her durability is weird to me um serpentine agility is a very strong um like defensive ability to only be hit on fives and sixes 
but she's only on a four up save, not a three up like the base vampire lord. And she doesn't have the hunger. So she doesn't really have a good way to heal herself other than, you know, the heroic action. Um, so I think her durability leaves some to be desired. Uh, the Time Swallower's Maw, I think you're basically only going to use as like a last ditch attempt, you know, finish some things off. She's going to die in a way. Um, but the drawback of losing the Serpentine Agility is so big and the effect is so swingy. Um, there's a fair chance that it does absolutely nothing um, that I don't think you're really going to be using that often. The big draw to me here is her spell. Um, Death Constriction is really good. Um, a decent range, um, but it can shut down, you know, if you're worried about a blizzard, if you're worried about like a block of fusiliers, um, you know, any like one big threat you can castle around her, shut that down. Uh, and she's a double caster, which is nice, but she doesn't have any bonuses to cast. Uh, and more importantly, this season, she's not a locust because she's unique. Um, so I think it's, she can't go in Acolytes. She can't take a um, lore of Primal Frost spell. So I think she's a little bit awkward right now. Yeah, it's interesting because um, you made a couple of really good call-outs. When you compare it to a traditional vampire on foot, uh, it is 10 more points more expensive. That's not really an issue. It's the fact that she has a four-up four, four up save where a normal vampire would have three. Yeah. She's missing fly. She's missing the hunger. And I think we both agree, because um, we were discussing this prior, um, it's the hunger that I feel like is a real clincher, that the fact that there's no hunger means that I want this model in combat and I want to be regenerating. I think the the hunger in, in conjunction with the serpentine agility would be a wonderful combination. But yeah, correct me if I'm wrong, right Matt. She just kind of gets chipped down. Is she the only vampire with no hunger? She is. Every other vampire in Soul Blight has the hunger. Even bats have the hunger, which are missing the vampire keyword, but they're still vampires and they, they have it too. Um, All right. Even the little like one wound vampire foot troop models um, all have it so that they can heal up, you know, their one token three wound guy in the unit that exists basically probably solely so that the hunker actually does something for them. But yeah. So yeah, it's an interesting one, right? So let's let's assume that there is no errata. And by the way, folks, we are recording this um, before, obviously, the book goes live. So there might be a day one errata where things may change, okay? So take this with a grain of salt. Check Warhammer community. Things may have changed um, since the time of recording. Let's assume that there is no change to Sekhar, right? She doesn't gain fly. She doesn't gain the hunger. Would you take this model in your army? And if so what parts of this war scroll are drawing you to the 160? I don't think I would take her as stance, no. I think if she did get the hunger, I could see maybe swinging it. Um, but as stands, she's a little too fragile and she doesn't do quite enough to warrant it. She is keyworded to Legion of Blood. Would you consider this in a Legion of Blood list? You know, you have Nephi, you have her wonderful spell making you ethereal. Um, like, would you still probably not? Um, I don't think she really does anything in Legion of Blood that she doesn't do anywhere else. It's not like she has any particularly good interactions. Um, you can give her a bonus to cast, which is nice for her spell. Um, you can give her extra attacks, but none of it really changes, like, the fundamental lack of doing anything that she's got going on, I think. But yeah, I, I tend to agree with you. Like, as much as I like the model and as I much as... She's like, just, really cool. She's a cool model. I, I, I dig the snake. I love the ability yeah. to be able to get within six inches and let's say there's that um spell casting savant who's your blizzard wizard or you know you've got those people just behind the lines that you can't quite get to because you got some really tanky 
unit holding them up. You could, especially on a low movement, you know, cities as examples, Skaven, there's a whole range of them. Yep. Um, you could you could potentially delete them. It's kind of like the um, uh, the gnashing jaws, but especially those, if they're all castled up, if you can just go and hit all of them, you know. Yep, those Gits wizards like that. That's neat. But I would per if I would if I was running Setcar, I think I would be always using serpentine agility, and as you said. The time swallower more is a last resort. Like it's not a strategy that I want to run forward and and unleash it and do as much damage as possible. No, I want to keep her being hit only on fives and sixes. That 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 to me is more valuable than the time swallower more. Unless it's going to be a grand strategy, I could claim the, the objective. I could stop you from scoring your grand strat. Unless there was something niche that was coming up from a interaction. Yeah, it's there when you need it, but I wouldn't plan to be using it. Would you buy the model? Absolutely. Yeah, I think it's a sick model. She's really cool looking. I love her snake. I love her hat. Super cool. All right. And it sounds like we both agree that we probably aren't taking her right now. Let's assume, hello, Cat Familiar, um, Let's assume that day one or in the next couple of weeks that the hunger does get eroded. So let's say they're like, oops, sorry, we forgot to add this. We thought it was uh, on there and it was misprinted. Does that change your thoughts around taking Sekar if she had the hunger at 160 points? I do think it makes her survivability a lot better. <sighs> okay. I think this season it's still hard to justify her um because she isn't a locus and there's so much that really wants you to have a locus um you know battle plans acolytes battalion um the lore of primal frost but maybe next season i could see including her because i think with the hunger she then becomes a decent unit um just not well suited for the current season yeah, look, I love the death construct spell. I think you're right. Like, that's a great way to be able to you know, stop Blizzard, be able to stop certain armies um, doing certain things. I think that uh, at its range and its casting value is quite nice. Um, but you do have a lot of flexibility with vampires. I guess the question is, if you've already got enough um, locuses in your army and this is just another hero, I think not so bad. But if you've only got one or so locusts, you, you might be thinking about, do I take her, a necromancer, a vampire on foot? I guess pros and cons. Uh, there is an argument why you take her, but I think in most competitive lists, it might be not right now. Yeah. Especially because if you're running Legion of Blood, you know, your first two hero slots are probably Neferata and a Vampire Lure and Zombie Dragon. Yeah, so, so straight away you're already at, what, almost 1,000 points, what, 900? 800? Yeah. All right. Anything else we want to talk about with Sekar? I mean, fun model, interesting rules, um, is missing some things that are traditionally on other vampires. Um, I can I can live without fly. I, I don't think I can live without hunger. That's about where I am, yeah. I think... I think that that's the tipping point for me. So uh, if hunger comes on, I take it. If not, uh, probably not. All right. So that is our new one and only new unit. But there are a heap of other new rules. Um, so continuing on the Soul Blight Gravelord train, there is a army of renown. So an army of renown um, to actually, Maddie, you are the more talk of rules. I'll let you explain what a army of renown is first. So an army of renown is basically an alternate set of allegiance abilities for an army. They replace all the allegiance abilities in your battle tome. So no passives, um, all the enhancements in your battle tome. You can't pick from those. Uh, the battle tactics, grand strategy in your battle tome, you don't get those battalions, nothing. Um, and usually they have some sort of restriction on what war scrolls you can include. For example, this one's dire wolves, fell bats, and vampire heroes with wounds characteristic 12 or less uh, without a sub faction keyword. Um, it is not a sub faction itself, notably. Um, it's just a different type of army 
but generally they provide like a new flavorful way to play the army other than the one you're used to. Cool. So really good, really good um, overview. So a couple of key call outs I want to make here. So um, if you look at any Soul Black Grave Lords list, the grand strategy they normally pick would either be Empire of Corpses or Lust for Domination. They are unavailable to you if you take a Scions of New Lamia. Your Law of the Vampire and your Law of the Necromancer or whatever the other second law is, they are unavailable to you. Um, what else? Like your artifacts and things like that, they are unavailable to yep. you. Instead, you're going to get a bunch of new ones. So um, it's, it's going to be up to you what you prefer, and you will see some of them in um, Age of Sigma. So King Broad Stomp is a perfect example where um, players will sacrifice certain rules for King Broad Stomp, and they like it. KO was another one, the double shoot with the um, the Ironclads, whatever it was. Um, gun haulers. Um, we're talking death here. Who cares, about, who cares about KOs? Like it's not in the show. Um, so this would be the question for you. So let's see with Maddie. Um, is the trade off worth it? And how would you build the list? So Sons Scions of New Lamia. If you take it, your army can only can constitute of uh, the keyword direwolves, fell bats, vampire heroes, and with a wounds characteristic of twelve or less. They also cannot have. Um, they don't have a sub-faction keyword. So, Maddie, what does that mean for us at a very high level? So, direwolves and fell bats are self-explanatory. Um, the vampire heroes part, it excludes vampire lords and zombie dragons because they are too many wounds. Um, it excludes, you know, things like the Virko's foot heroes, um, Manfred, um, Bordry. Uh, it also currently excludes neverada would be too many wounds anyway but weirdly it excludes uh Sekar, the new foot hero because she's legion of blood keyworded that's probably an oversight um i could see that getting changed yeah same. Uh, like she, she's on the box art like she she's, literally yeah is the she's box the poster. it makes no sense yeah so i i would expect that to get changed um but Foot Vampire Lords are fine, Vigorian Lords, um, you know, the Coven Throne, the Palanquin. Uh, Cato also works uh, because he can't benefit from a sub-faction, but this is not a sub-faction, and he will get the abilities just fine. Um, I, so he's actually pretty good in it. I will rewind you, though. I know you did say that the Dire Wolves and the Fell Bats were obvious, um, but I will counter you and say that what isn't obvious, maybe, is you can't take skeletons, zombies, black knights, uh, blood knights. Yeah, nothing else. So though that that's where the uh, you're building an army around dire wolves, fell bats, and vampire heroes. So even like in your castellai, where you can make you know battle line blood knights, unavailable to you. This is literally what you're building around. You've got a very limited pool. It is very limited. So what do I get with this limitation? So they all get the, sci the, the Scions of New Lamia. We understand that. Cool, cool keyword. So first off, Scions of New Lamia Vampire Lord gains the battle line battlefield role. Okay, so I can make battle line vampires. That seems kind of cool. The problem is you don't have, they're still leaders. So you don't have the spots to do like a Doomseeker style build um, where you're just spamming heroes. Um, and Firewolves are battle line already. Uh, Felbats aren't. So if you wanted to do like Vampires and Felbats, um, that does give you that option. But I think usually um, with how limited a unit pool you have, you're already probably going to be good on battle line yeah i mean like if somebody wanted to run i don't know double or triple coven throne for example then like cool you could and you fulfill your battle line with three vampires on foot like that's your battle line and the rest of them could be vengorian lords and whatever you want but fill it to your heart's content well um, you're still think... locked to four behemoths yeah, yeah, I know, but like so, four behemoths, three hundred points each. That's still one thousand two hundred points. 
Yeah, but then what do you put in the rest? It's going to be wolves and bats. All I'm saying is that you can do some things with your battle line, but it's not a big deal. It's ba to your point with the Doom Seekers, it's not like you can fill a whole army with solo yeah. vampires. Like you can't do that because of the restrictions, but it's an option. If you wanted to just run, I don't know, whatever, whatever. It's 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 not a big deal. Um, Six vampire friendly, lords and all fell bats for the rest. You got the uh, friendly scions of New Lamia have a ward of six plus. Um, okay, that's very basic for death. For death Everyone, special. Yeah, I think your cat's going crazy. He's super excited about the the minions rule. Um, the next rule is the New Lamia Invocation. So in your hero phase, you can pick three friendly scions of New Lamia summonable units, wholly within 12 inches of friendly scions of New Lamia heroes. You can either heal um, up to three wounds allocated to that unit, or you can return a number of slain models to it with a combined wounds characteristic of three or less. Add one to the number of slain models if that the returned to that unit is wholly within six inches of a friendly Sans and Ulamia hero. You cannot pick the same unit to benefit from this ability more than once per phase. This is basically the equivalent of Deathly Invocation. Um, there's no grave sites, so it's only within six inches of a hero here, um, which is definitely limiting. It means that if you want the res, you have to be um, like babysat by a hero. Um, so that's kind of a big downside there. Okay, uh, so I'm... dire wolves also are always awkward with um, the invocation because they're two wounds. So you're either you have one damaged, and you're healing at one and that's it or um you are resurrecting um a dire wolf and then you get the bonus dire wolf um if you're within six so it's weird because you always want the dire wolf to fully die you never want it to just take one wound yeah because then you're only healing up one as opposed yeah. to yeah put you in a really Most awkward spot yep Okay, so like it, it's, you know, for death players, they're probably very familiar with it, but the key is going to be it's really based around heroes as opposed to um, taking advantage to your grave sites, which, by the way, there are no grave sites in this. So that's another call out. No grave sites for you. The next rule is the spell. So we talked a little bit earlier about the two spell laws uh, are not available to you, but in its place, you gain Grave Call. So all friendly wizards in the Scions of New Lamia gain Grave Call. So it's a spell with the casting value of six and a range of 18. If successfully cast, pick one friendly Scions of New Lamia summonable unit, so your dogs or your bats. Uh, wholly within range and visible to the caster, you can add D3 models to this unit. And a cool rule is it can take you beyond its starting size. Good spell. It's pretty good, yeah. Um, it reminds me of the Virko's heroic action. Um, very similar effect there. Uh, and notably, one nice thing about this, it's not a spell lore. It's something that all friendly wizards just get. Um, so if you take, say, like a vampire lord, you can have your vampire lord know Horfrost or Blizzard or Flaming Weapon, uh, and it'll still get Grave Call. Good call out. So um, even though you do not have the Soul Black Grave Lord spell laws, you can still access the universal one. So you can still take Levitate and Flaming Weapon, you can still take, um, yeah, so you, you've got those options. And um, to your point, it, it, you can still take Hall Frost, Blizzard, or Rupture. So uh, a couple of good spell options. For sure. But is it worth sacrificing a whole spell lore for this one spell? Probably not. The Soul Blight spells are quite good, too. Yeah, especially like when you roll the is it the ten plus or the nine plus, you get to you know get additional benefits on that spell as well. So yeah. straight away, like, yeah, there's some good spells you'll be missing out on. 
the bigger problem um, that I found while trying to like brew with it too is that there's only one. And that means you run out of spells to cast very, very quickly. Um, you know, if you've got a unique vampire, um, those only know this in their War Scroll spell and, you know, Bolt Shield. Um, if you're trying to take like Coven Thrones, Palanquins, um, Vangorian Lords, those all get the generic lore, but you know, how many times can you really cast? Sure, you know, one of them's got flaming weapon. You probably don't need levitate because what, do you want flying dire wolves? Everything else in your army flies. Um, and ghost mist has never really been particularly good. Um, your foot vampire lords get lore of primal frost. And I think that's really where you're going to be getting most of the rest of your spells from. But if you're getting, you know, two casts on this hero, two casts on that hero, one cast here, one cast there, if you're really trying to do like a vampire hero heavy list, which is something that the army of renown seems to be trying to, you know, push you into, uh, you just really don't have the quantity of spells to support it because you can't cast spells more than once. So you run out. Might be good for, if Sekhar does get included into this Army of Renown, being a double caster, it would give you a bit more flexibility. We are assuming that she gets added to this in some loophole. But, uh, yeah, like, you you are going to run out of spells pretty quickly because a lot of your heroes you can include in this are all wizards. There's only so many There's only so many grave calls you can cast, and that answer oh, is fine. one. One per turn. Exactly, exactly the point is that you run out of spells. Yeah. At it's least like one can, cast. Some of them are two casts, you know. It's not like you can cast Mystic Shield twice in a turn. Um, yep. So, all right, it's a good spell. We'll, we'll, we'll call it as it is, and we'll make an assumption at the end or a, a call at the end. Is it worth trading off being Legion of Blood, Legion of Night, Veer Cross, whatever? Um, now, you're going you're gonna to crush me on my pronunciation of this one. Is it Bacchanal of Blood? Bacchanal? I don't know. Uh, I'm notorious for the same things wrong. Um, anyway, the whatever that is of blood, friendly signs and the alarm of vampire heroes are bloodthirsty while they're within three inches of enemy units. Add one to the attack, attack characteristic uh, of melee weapons. Um, if they are uh, outside of three inches, they're empowered. They get plus one to casting, dispelling, and unbinding. So this is the same rule from Legion of Blood? Yes. This is the Legion of Blood rule. You, you, basically, yes. if you... Wizard is in combat, he gets plus one attack. If he's out of combat, plus one to casting, unbinding, and dispelling rolls. Yeah, it's a pretty solid rule. Um, I like this with the bigger vampires too, um, because like Coven Thrones have three different attack profiles, Palanquins have two. Um, so you can, you know, double, triple up on the plus one attacks. Um, adding to casting rails is nice when all of your heroes cast. Um, unlike the Legion of Blood one, you can get plus two with Kato. Um, so that's fun. But that, that, it's it's the same as the Legion of Blood one, basically. Um, so yeah, so it's, it's, that's a good rule. In itself, if you haven't played with that rule in yeah, the past, that, that, that's a solid rule. That's a good rule. Now, the reason why you take Scions of New Lamia, the whole reason is this particular set of rules. It's the most unique part of this book. So we're going to unpack this a little more. So Demise by Design. At the start of your hero phase, you can say that one of your Scions of New Lamia units are attempting one of the plots in the de Demise by Design table. We'll get to that in a minute. Uh, uh, by the start of your next hero phase. You must tell your opponent which plot you are attempting. The same unit cannot attempt the same plot more than once per battle. If the unit completes the plot, it gains a corresponding plot ability for the rest of the battle. If the unit has already gained a plot ability, you must choose which one to keep. You cannot have more than one plot on a unit. So you, so you, you replace it, 
Um, we've seen something like this before, Maddie, haven't we? We've seen this on uh, the old Zinch battle Yeah, tone. the old Zinch book has a similar similar rule. It also has like Castel Castellife, for example, has similar type of things where if you do something, Earth, yeah, you get a yeah, yeah, yeah similar. Those are all um, they have to kill something basically. Yes, Different yes, for what it is. But but it's a similar concept. Um, do a thing, well, gain a thing in return. I think the biggest difference between this and the Castellai one is you have to declare this beforehand versus the Castellai one, it's just a passive effect. You know, you kill your thing, you get your buff. Um, so it definitely reminds me a lot more of those old um, agendas of anarchy or the Zinch one, um, where you need to declare it beforehand and then carry it out. Um, yes. I think some of them are even the same, which is interesting. Well, let's uh, have a look at them. Let's have a look at them. Best. So this is this is the concept, right? You declare a thing, you do the thing, you get the reward. So um, was it the thematic realignment? Um, you pick a friendly wizard. It must successfully cast two spells this hero phase that are not unbound. Uh, the benefit is plus one to casting rolls for that wizard. Maddie, thoughts? This one's kind of annoying to achieve just because of how many units in your army are actually going to have two casts. Um, Sekar does, uh, assuming she gets to be allowed to include it. Um, the Coven Throne can get a second cast. Um, all your locuses, you know, have the potential to get a second cast. Um, but like a lot of your units are just going to be single cast units. Um, so it's a little bit tricky to pull this off. Um, yeah. Since a lot of times you're going to be jumping through hoops um, to get your plus one to cast. Plus, if a opponent really was worried about you getting plus one to your cast, they would maybe use a primal magic dice to try to stop uh, one of your yeah. two casts. So um, it could it could be nice, like turn one, turn one, uh, stay out of unbind range, get um, magical dominance, turn one, get the two spells off. If you've got arcane terrain, sit next to it get those two spells off outside of unbind range and this could be a really nice turn one thing but outside of that this could be hard the problem with that is a turn one um assumedly you know if you're saying out of unbind magical dominance you're taking top of turn one mm -hmm. um in which case you won't have your option for um the seasonal second cast so your options are either uh, your Coven Throne, since you're going first, will have an extra cast. Or Sekar, I think, is the only native two caster you have access to. I think. I believe so. Yeah, I believe so. I was just having a look, and I, I believe that uh, I'm because of the. Sure she's the only one. Assuming because of, we even get her at all. Yes, yeah, the, 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 yeah, correct. Like, we're making an assumption that we are getting um, Sekar, but uh, if not, you're right. You need to go second to get that extra spell cast. And you're potentially playing with fire depending on who your opponent is yeah good rule and Just again you get you do have the coven throne that does get um a second cast uh if if you go first in a command point if you go second um so that it is still an option uh um, yeah it's just very pool, very pool. finicky yes yeah no okay interesting so uh, you so I guess the the high level thing is not a lot of wizards are to native casts. You are either getting an extra cast by going second in the battle round for the current realm rules. If Sekra is um, allowed, we have a native double caster, or we have um, the the Coven Throne. If they go first, if they go first, they get an extra spell yeah. cast. So maybe a consideration of a coven throne in your list to get this Re recruitment drive uh pick one friendly unit it must destroy an enemy unit uh, that starts the turn with five or more models the ability you get if you achieve it is add one to the the attack characteristic of that friendly unit's melee weapons 
I think this one is relatively achievable. Um, on the whole, I think that this army of renown has a little bit of a damage output problem, but five or more models, you know, kill a screen, get some extra attacks on your bats or your wolves or, you know, your coven throne. Um, as long as, you know, there's a unit that's like squishy enough for you to kill. I don't think this one is too hard to ask. Who's, who's, you know. who's a good who's a good recipient for something like this are you thinking like vengo lord uh are you thinking dire wolves like you know dire wolves have um, volume of attacks vengo well i like the coven volume. throne again uh as far as like heroes go uh or the vengo lord because they've both got three profiles on them so you're getting three um attacks as opposed to like you know like a foot vampire lord would only get one um Dire wolves, their attacks aren't very good, but you're getting a lot of them. Feldbats have surprisingly good attacks, so they're also not a bad choice, um, especially because they get extra attacks from their own ability, too. So you could stack up a lot of attacks on Feldbats. And I think that's the interesting thing, you know, do you go for quality of attacks and the Vango Lord, for example, getting an extra attack on the Gore Drenched Talons, turning it to four attacks, you know, Ren 2, three damage a piece is, is you know, it's quite quite quality. Um, on the flip side, your Dire Wolves and your Felbats, you're getting an extra volume of attacks, add, add a layer of Hoarfrost onto, into the mix and... You know, yes, they're not the most potent damage, but it's the volume that will clear screens or you're, you know, you're going for lots of ones. Yeah. Horfrost and Felbats are pretty scary too. Like they're damaged too, which no one ever expects because they're little bitey bats. But um, if you can get Horfrost off and get a bunch of those extra attacks, um, you know, one from this, uh, their own ability gives it and stacks. Um, you know, you could easily have like six, seven attack fell bats. Yeah, they are a little um, bit under under assuming, aren't they? When you look at it, you're like, oh, just bets. They just like they suck. You up assume the it's like a little chaff unit, you know, like furies or something, but they have no rend, so it's kind of swinging on their own. Um, but they are damaged too. And they're super annoying because they can retreat and charge as well. Yep. So that's <laughs> super annoying. Uh, a worthy vintage. So if you pick a friendly unit, that you uh, it must destroy an enemy hero or monster. Uh, you add one to the save rolls for attacks that target that friendly model. Um, this one is interesting. It really depends on... You know, if you've got little five wound foot heroes, those are easy to kill, but they're relatively well protected versus nothing in this army is super killy. So it's going to be tough to bring down those, you know, big centerpiece heroes and monsters. Um, but uh, things like the Coven Throne or the Palanquin really want to be hero hunting anyway. Um, the Palanquin gives everything around it extra attacks if you kill a hero, and uh, the Coven Throne has a spell. Uh, I think it's like D3 Mortal Wounds. It's not a lot, but if you kill a hero with it, you get a Vampire Lord, which is cute. Um, just... But so it's neat that you have a reward that sort of... Um, pushes those units to do what they wanted to do anyway. And I think it's a good buff on them too, because they're a four up base save. So having that extra bit of survivability is nice. Yeah, the un undying servitude spell from the uh, the Palaquin is going to help you achieve that. But also the um, the Coven Throne with that whale, the, the whale yep. of screaming or whatever, whale of whatever, um, it can do damage as well. So a nice way, because again, there's a lot of heroes, you're right, that are, that are hiding behind the lines, whether they're Blizzard Wizards or whether they are there just purely as supports. Um, and hey, get yourself a free vampire if you uh, trigger the little combination as well. 
the Palanquin's whale is annoyingly a little bit of a non-bow because um, the plus one attack ability from the Palanquin specifies uh, slain by an attack, and the whale isn't an attack. Um, True, it was an ability. I was thinking it was because yeah. it used to because it used to be a shooting attack, and now it's turning to an ability. Yeah. Uh... It's still nice. Um, you know, it's a big AOE effect. And again, it can help you sort of get those hard to reach heroes. Um, 16 inch, four up D3 mortal wounds. Everything in that range, mind you, is like, that's that's a pretty good anti-castle effect. The plot doesn't specify attacks though. It doesn't say- The it, plot it says doesn't, pick, no. Yeah. No, the plot, yes. Yeah, I just wanted to call that out. Like specifically the plot, you could kill them with an ability and you would trigger um you would trigger the the, the, the plot so um not bad not bad plus one save is not bad uh, and then finally the queen's prize so pick a friendly unit it must be contesting an objective you control that was controlled by your opponent at the start of the turn your turn uh the the ability if you achieve it is each model in that friendly unit counts as two models instead when determining a uh, control for objectives Presumably intended to be instead of one. Um, good on dire wolves, good on bats. Um, easy to score. I think this is going to be the default one most turns um, because it rewards you for doing what you need to be doing to score. Um, the effect on it is really strong. Um, just good plot overall. Yeah, it's predict it's predictable. You know, unlike yeah. having to kill something or uh, you look at the spell casting, there's failure points. This one, if I have a unit, of, correct. I have a unit of ten or twenty doggos. They walk on a point. Even if I don't get engaged in combat, I can take over the objective. They now count as two instead of one when contesting objectives. So, um, very very easy to score. Yeah. Maddie, overall plots thoughts are these something that you like? Something that's achievable? Something that you'd want to build a list around, or are these just right now? I'd be better off playing this at my local store for funsies and maybe sticking with my traditional list at my next GT. I think they're super fun, but I think the only one that's like going to be really game changing is the Queen's Prize. Um, good effects on the other ones, but you know there is a little bit of a hoop for them, and the units that can receive the buffs um, aren't necessarily units that are super going to benefit from them. Um, you know, plus one attacks is good, but again, your best options are basically like Vangorian Lord or Coven Throne. It's not like you can put that on Graveguard or something. Yeah. Um, so it definitely helps make your mediocre damage output a little more consistent. Um, but I don't really think it's going to make or break very much. Um you know, plus one to save, it's a good effect, especially, you know, if you did go chase down an enemy hero, you're probably now in the middle of their army, so. Um, but I feel like they're not going to be game-changing, you know. Fun rules, probably not our next 5 and OGT list. But yeah. hey, someone might prove me wrong. Someone might take this to Adepticon, prove me wrong, and then I'll be interviewing them going, what craziness did you <laughs> unlock? But right now it's hard for me to justify dropping legion of blood legion of night veer cross any of the other combinations i would rather castellai and people know i'm not the biggest fan of castellai <laughs> i would still run castellai over this right now but we still have other rules to un unpack so let's not jump too much to conclusion but right now it's hard, a hard sell at the moment um, you do have a command trait, so your general is going to get Keeper of the Royal Menagerie. At the end of your movement phase, you can pick one destroyed friendly Scions of New Lamia summonable unit and roll a dice 
on a three plus a replacement unit with half the models are set up and just blah 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 outside of 12 so wholly within 12 inches of the general more than three from enemy units uh the unit cannot attempt to charge or pile in in the same turn and each unit that's destroyed can only be replaced once a replaced unit cannot be replaced again this is yeah, an allegiance I mean ability like this is this is your old legion it's ability. basically they moved the allegiance ability into a command trait um it's also you know pared down it can only be set up around that general so it's got the big weakness basically of if you focus down and kill the general um that's all of your unit recursion gone yeah um, so i need to i need to protect and really engine yeah well, I think it makes a Vingorian Lord the best general choice for it. Um, you've got that three up save, you know, uh, it's a little tankier, uh, the rend reduction. Um, so I, I do like it on a Vingorian Lord more than, you know, trying to like put it on a foot vampire or something. Well, but you could also just hide it behind walls of chaff. Well, that, that exactly where I was going to lead you to is that you've got the artifact called the Crown of Command where you, the bearer gets a five-up ward while they're within three inches of a friendly summonable unit. So all of a sudden, you could be creating a Vampire Lord on foot with a base save of three up with a ward of five plus that's hugging a block of bats or direwolves or uh, whatever, and maybe there are spell casting savants you've got to keep them around and you know there's a pretty survive and then obviously got the hunger that you're healing up as well that could be quite a durable little unit getting plus one to cast because it's not engaged in combat good artifact yeah it's a pretty good artifact um i feel like the problem with trying to hide a foot hero here is that again you're like so low on you know quality damage here that you really do i think need your heroes getting in need them hitting things because if they're not hitting things you just don't have the damage output to kill anything um you know maybe you can have one like hide a little way until you know the hammers are dealt with at least but i think you're definitely going to want them getting into combat i guess the other challenge maddie as well is the vampire if you did what i said um you don't have spirit gale so you could be getting plus one to cast but you're not getting the mortal wounds from afar um that spirit gale seems to really enjoy even like vile transference like being able to uh just can't, yeah you can definitely I mean, still pull them up you know like take a vampire lord with blizzard sitting on a point surrounded in wolves like if they want the point they'll have to approach you mm. but... which is something you're currently seeing at the moment i've seen some dire wolf heavy lists where there's been a, a blizzard wizard like a necromancer behind the scenes and just yep. you get into that threat range because you're right the dire wolves and the, and the bats aren't going to do the most amount of damage on their own that's why grave guard is so powerful in soul blight because they're your damage dealer your vampire lord a damage dealer yeah, Black Knight's on the charge, damage dealer. Um, okay, good artifact. Um, command trait is something that you'd sacrifice as an allegiance ability. It's a good rule, but you're now choosing it as your command trait over anything else. Um, you obviously still can take um, the, the the General's Handbook one where you get all the spell law, which is still a valuable um, command trait if you don't want to take the Keeper of the Royal Menagerie. Uh, there is one grand strategy and three battle tactics. The grand strategy is perfect execution where uh, you complete the grand strategy if each plot from the demise from de design table was completed at least, at least once. So we do all four of them at least once, you get your grand strat. Do you like this or would you pick something from the general's handbook? It's garbage. I Why? would never choose it. Um, there are some armies that this just physically can't be completed against. If you fight Gargants, you're not getting recruitment drive. They don't, they're not running units with five or more models, unless they're running the Gets Regiment. But, um, like, you're just never scoring that. Um, and even against some armies where it might be physically possible, 
you're still probably not going to. You know, you fight most OBR lists, for example. They're taking a unit of Death Riders. Um, that's five models. Technically, if you take them from five to zero in one go, like, you could score it, but you're probably not going to. Um, it's the so. first one. It's the first one for me that makes it hard in this current season. The first all... one is hard, but at least it's always physically possible. You might have to, you know, go put a unit in the corner and hide it, jump through a lot of hoops. It's not worth it. You could just randomly fail, but at least it is always possible of your own volition, you know, versus recruitment drive. You can just face an army where it's physically impossible to score and you've lost that grand strategy guaranteed before the game started. I think we both agree this is tough. It's a tough yeah. one. And I would much rather something more in my control than something like this. So, I mean, it's cool. Don't get me wrong. I love the thematics behind it. I love the idea behind it. Again, if I went to my local uh, uh, store and I had a pickup game on a Thursday night and I knew my opponent wasn't going to be Seraphon or it wasn't going to be Corn or if it wasn't going to be Suns, uh, yeah, I, I'd take this and um, it would be my grand strat. But if I take it into a GT, um, it's probably going to be at least once or twice that I just can't score it for certain reasons. Yeah. The three battle tactics is uh, no sacred ground. Pick one enemy unit contesting an objective that you do not control. You complete this tactic if that unit if that unit is destroyed this turn by an attack made by a friendly summonable unit. So you've already talked about potentially some of the challenges of doing damage and um, maybe you're going to have to get that um, that that recruitment drive up just to improve the chances of that summonable unit doing the damage and killing the thing. Thoughts on this battle tactic? I don't think it's awful. Um, again, you know, fell bats can hit things, but they're kind of swingy. Um, I think this is definitely one of those where you need to wait for the right opportunity, you know? Like, there's a unit that's got a few models left. Um, go finish it off. Uh, or like a foot hero that went to go get an objective all on its own or something. Um, I would say it's fine. It's not an autocomplete battle tactic, but it's definitely doable. Yeah, it's situational. Like, it's not an auto... It's not, it's not an auto include, like, surround and destroy, but definitely... Uh, you got to pick the right moment at the right time and maybe do a bit of maths hammer to work out the the volume of damage your summonable units. Which I think is a good design, you know. Mm -hmm. like, Agreed. But you've got to pick your battles. Yeah. Yeah. Companions of Royalty, pick one friendly summonable unit on the battlefield uh, that has any slain model slain. You complete the tactic if any models are added to that unit this turn and the number of models in that unit are uh, basically are above the starting size at the end of the turn. This one's awkward. Um, because it's a, you know, it's a little bit random. Um, and none of the units have any innate healing. So you're basically relying on... Um, Death the invocation, but named different that I can't. Remember. Uh the uh, uh, the back the uh, no sorry the uh, the new Lamia invocation. Yeah, and um, the grave call. grave call to, you know, add your unit to get the size up and then return the slave models. Um, I think this can actually be a very interesting turn one tactic, if you set up on deadly. Um, you might be able to kill a model. Um, you just can't really like guarantee it or whatever, but uh, I think it's an interesting thing to keep in mind when you're deploying. Um, or damned, or damned terrain, take the D3 uh, so down. The problem take... with damned, um, you can set up for turn two with damned, but you can't like... Oh, cause it hasn't taken damage yet. Yeah. Mm. Um. So 
it's it's definitely awkward um this is situational i think it's it's interesting it's situational yeah. right like it it is achievable but you've got to make sure you don't take any damage uh because you can heal up but then you've got to be staying above the starting size at the end of the turn yeah so you've got to only have taken like you know you've lost like one model and i do think that damned is nice for it because you you can you can try to set up for a turn two um but you can't even guarantee the setup because you can roll a one on the damage for that yeah yeah spot on i mean if you take if, if you've taken if you've taken some damage from you know uh, I don't know, Sentinels yeah. or some cities yeah. and like there's been some chip damage and you've lost a doggo. Um, awesome. This is the perfect time to then pull out um, this particular battle tactic. But again, it's a timing thing. You can also rally um, before you declare it, which um, might help because then you know how many you're getting back. Might, might be uh -huh. still rough, though, because if, if you've got a unit of 10 doggos, you don't want to risk it if you've lost, like, four or five doggos. Um, like, really, the sweet spot, you've, you've lost one. Like, you've lost one and you... One is definitely get... the sweet spot because then you can... You know, you can't guarantee it, but you can... It, it'll probably work out, you know, which is all you can really ask for. Uh, exquisite plots is the other one where you complete the tactic if you complete a plot from the demise from design table uh, battle trait with a hero this turn this seems achievable this is good this is easy um you could either do one of the useful tactics for a hero you know kill um i probably wouldn't try cast with this just because it's so easy for your opponent to deny but one of the kill tactics, if you can pull it off, you know, you get your tactic and the hero gets a good buff. Um, you can also just do the queen's prize with one of your heroes. It won't do anything. Um, assuming that it is supposed to say instead of one. It doesn't I, say it. Uh, according yeah. to the book, that this is this is the exact wording from the that book. That needs... So. That needs an errata because if it's two models instead of one, you know, worst case, you can just do the Queen's Prize. And I think that's an easy battle tactic to score. You just get no buff effectively. If it's two models instead, then you're giving some of your heroes a debuff. Exactly. You turn, a Vengo, you turn the Vengo Lord from five to two. Like, oh, great. Yeah. Go, go, go me. Which I can't imagine that's how that's supposed to work out, but I don't think the intent was a debuff to your Vengo I think it's war. supposed to be instead of one, yeah. Probably. Probably. Um, but I do think that this one's super achievable. Very achievable. Very achievable. So we are at the end of the Scions of New Lamia abilities. This is the uh the army of renown. And we are going to talk about the regiments of renown in a minute, but to close out this particular part of the video. Maddie, as a Soul Black Grey Lords player, are you going to take Scions of New Lamia? And if you did, why? And if you're not, why not? I might take it to like casual night at my LGS or something, but I definitely would not take this to a GT. Um, its list building restrictions are very awkward. Um, you have basically no hammers. Um, all your chaff, you don't have any of the particularly like hoardy durable chaff, you know, no skeletons, no zombies, um, no, you know, dark misted blood knights. Um, and your heroes, I think, are really crippled by that lack of spells. Um, your recursion being centered only around your general, uh, I think is also a big downside to it because it means your recursion can be super easily dealt with if they snipe out your general um the grand strategy is bad and there's not really a great great option for it either you've got spellcasting savant always an option um 
I don't really like overshadow for it because your battle line is squishier than normal soul blight. Uh, again, no zombies, no skeletons. And you don't really have the killing power to deal with theirs. You can do barren ice scape. That's fine, you know. Kill their artifacts, keep them out of the middle. Um, but definitely, you know, less guaranteed than soul blights. Uh, options because those are very good. Same for the battle tactics. Um, the battle tactics aren't bad. I don't think this army has trouble scoring battle tactics between the general's handbook ones and these, but it doesn't have the, you know, set of basically autocomplete battle tactics that Soul Blight has access to. Um, and the plots just don't do enough for the army to make up for all that it's lost. Um, I think that, like, if I was to attempt to make a competitive build with this army, it would just be trying to spam wolves and bats, and at that point, I would just play Virkos. Like, And for the people who want to see that list, hang on towards the end, we will go through Maddie's fun list. But I don't want to spend too, I mean, we spent a lot of time unpacking this. So hopefully you are clear. And if you are going to take this army of renown, you know why. And then you have a really good understanding. But hopefully we've talked to you about the limitations. And armies of renown are not all meant to be the most competitive top tier builds. And it's not meant to be a band-aid to fix bad armies. I just want to call this out because it seems like most people, when they see a bad army of renown, they, they feel slighted. And realistically, these are all about a force that is thematic to the book, to this particular Mad King Rises, um, that ties in nicely to the story. It's meant to be fun. Yes, a couple of outliers like KO, like Suns will come out and they will be strong. But for a lot of parts, they're mostly fun, different, alternative ways to play your army and more likely enough, not worth the sacrifice. And I think that's my summary is that while these are cool rules, I feel like I'm losing more than I gain from a Legion Soul Black Grave Lords. I'm, I'm missing too much, whether it is the unit selection, whether it is the spells, whether it is other things up throughout the book, the Grave Tides and, and things like that. Um, I, I, unlike Sons of Behemoth, where when I trade for King Broad Stomp, I'm winning more than I'm losing, or at least it's a viable trade this feels like i'm trading down it feels like i'm giving a uh, really expensive car to receive a push bike like i just it's not a comparable trade for sure i also think it doesn't have a strong focus it's pulling you in a couple different directions and it doesn't really reward any of them particularly well I, I would I actually wouldn't be scared of this allowing you to have vampire lords on zombie dragons. If you want to have four of them, I, I don't care. Like I I four vampire lords on zombie dragons, two thousand points. That is your battle line. Like basically, just uh, death's version of sons. Cool. You got you got four models that count as five on an objective. Go hunt and be free. Like I don't, I don't care less. Like I'm not scared of that. I don't know. I don't know, Maddie. Anything else you want to say on this? So let's move to the uh, uh, regiments of renown. Uh, yeah, we can move on. Uh, All right. These are exciting. I think they're cool. Cool. All right. So let's close that off. Fun, interesting, maybe not in X5 to know. Someone proved me wrong and I'll have to interview. Anyway, so let's um, let's go into the uh, regiments of renown. So there are six regiments of renown. So this is not a whole faction, really just a combination of units that you get to bring into your army. So the high level thing is that you are defined by a set of units. So there will always be a Mortark in it and there will also be a set of units. They will bring a bunch of additional abilities. They are packaged in a certain price point, um, but you cannot bring this into your army if it is the same uh, legion. So, for example, in Neferata's Royal Echelon, for example, I cannot take this regiment of renown 
in a Soul Blight Grave Lords list. I can bring it into Nighthorn, I can bring it into Ossiarch Bone Reapers, and I can bring it into Flesh Eater Courts. Regardless if they are an ally selection, I bring them in to the list and it allows me to go over my points because uh, for my, sorry, it doesn't let me go on my points. Uh, it allows me to go over what I would normally have as an ally pool. So for example, uh, this Neferata Echelon is 600 points. Normally I can only take 400 points of my uh, allies. This allows me to go above that because they are mercenaries, not allies. They are. Allies. Just, they just have. An exception. They yeah, are allies. Just, they just have an exception, but they're but still they, subject to the restriction of like uh, you can't take spells on allies, for example. Co correct, correct. But like for example, Ossiac Bone Reapers cannot take allies, but I can take Neferata's yep. Royal Echelon. So I'm, I, I guess I'm trying to make this as simple as possible to understand the concept. And then, yes, like that ally. They're like crown spine, kind of. Yeah. Like go trek, you know? They they exceed the ally cap. Good call out. It is like a uh, it is like a crown spine, just without the uh, the feel bads when you put it on the table. So <laughs> Neferata's royal echelon. I get Neferata, I get five black knights, I get ten death rattle, ten death rattle. I can't reinforce them, by the way, probably another call out. So I can't increase this size at all. This is a unique combination. So I can take them as long as I'm not a soul like Grave Lord's army. In its plate, what I get for this package, so additionally to the War Scrolls, uh, they all have a six-up ward, so Deathless uh, Retainers you'll see across the board. Uh, you'll get the Queen's, uh, the Blood Queen's Will once per battle at the end of the Battleshock phase. If the Neferata in this Regiment of Renown is on the battlefield, you can replace the battle tactic you picked at the start of your hero phase with a different eligible battle tactic if you do so. You, uh, you must pick a battle tactic that has not already been completed. Note that you can pick a battle tactic that you've already picked uh, that wasn't completed. So if you failed it, uh, this does give you a second shot on that battle tactic. Uh, the other one is the Blood Queen's Blade. So that of your hero phase, you pick one enemy unit within 12 inches of Neferata in this Regiment of Renown. Until your next hero phase, ward rolls cannot be made for that enemy unit against mortals and wounds and mortal wounds caused by attacks made by this regiment of renown. Six hundred points, Maddie. What's our thoughts? Um, points wise, this is a discount over the composite parts. Um, all of them are. This one, I think, the Blood Queen's Will, super interesting ability. Um, swapping battle tactics, you know, it can save you, like, if you messed one up, um, rolled badly. One sort of annoying thing with it, um, kill tactics, for example, a lot of them require you to pick a unit to kill. If you've killed the unit, you can't pick it because it's not on the battlefield anymore. Um, so I think that it's a little bit situational with, um, you know, what you can swap into, but it's definitely a strong effect. Um, the problem is more the units in it, I think. Um, Neferata, she's great in Soul Blight, but she's not really a particularly good ally. Um, a lot of her effects are Legion of Blood keyworded, so they're only going to apply to herself, not even the rest of the Regiment of Renown, because they're not Legion of Blood. So, you know, she can cast Dark Mist on herself, set herself back up at the end of deployment. She's minus one to hit. Um, but that's all localized exclusively to her. And so, you know, she's kind of tanky. She's very fast, which is nice. Um, counts as five on objectives. Um, she's a good hero killer. But overall, I don't really see her adding much to any army in particular. I think that there's just kind of better options for the most part that those armies are going to want to be taking. Um, and then the Black Knights and Skeletons, they're chaff kind of, like... They're not really doing all that much. Um, 
So I think that if you're taking this, you're really taking it for, um, for the battle tactic swapping. Maybe if you're in a meta that has a lot of like centerpiece heroes and you want to try to dagger of jet them with Neferata, you know, that might be cute. Um, and I don't think the ward roll thing is going to be super impactful here just because this isn't really a regiment of heavy damage dealers. Um, it helps, you know, them get what, um, you know, if Neferata is going after a hero or something, but it's not, it's not going to be a game changer. Um, no, the I Black Knights would do it. Mediocre. The Black Knights the Black would do a little fine. bit of damage. They'll do a little yeah. bit of damage. They do mortals. They're not a hammer, charge. but they can, they can do some work. Skeletons uh, the charge decent. mortals don't get the no ward effect though, because it's a tax only. No, no, but I'm saying like, you know, generally the, the army of renown, the regiment of renown, you get a little bit of chip damage from the Black Knights. Yeah. Uh, the, the death rattle skeletons are okay. You take them because of their recursion at the start of combat, they can come back, but they are, are only intense. 10 models. They're only yeah. 10. So they're, they're going to get wiped screen. pretty easily. But it's decent. Yeah. They're screened. But so who, who would best benefit from this? Like, is there a particular um whether it's an archetype or a does anything come to mind with like who might benefit from taking neferata and her friends i don't think any of the existing armies particularly want this one um night haunt maybe off the top of my head they're struggling their own units aren't necessarily the greatest but i don't know what this really adds to them um They've even got, you know, already natively uh, no wards. They've got, you know, good screens. They've got charge mortals. Um, like, this is way too expensive for OBR. And sure, they'd like screens, but they would like to not pay 600 points for screens. Um, and they don't really struggle with battle tactics. Um, Feck also... They've got their own, you know, screens. They've got fast units. They've got good battle tactic options. Um, it just doesn't really fill a niche that any of the armies are really missing. So I think if you are taking this, it's, you know, for the fluff, for the fun, you know, cute battle tax swapping ability. Uh, I don't really think there's a competitive place for it. Yeah, by the way, folks, we are talking at this purely from a match play point of view. If you have a mad narrative in your in your idea or you're looking for this to justify going out and buying Neferata, it's one of the kits that you've always wanted to buy, you do you, run the army to your heart's content. I guess I'm, we're speaking here to the most competitive folks who are thinking about, do I take this to my next grand tournament and does it add a layer to, to my list? And I think right now... The answer is probably no. Neferata can be a nice little hero hunter with her speed, being able to turn ethereal. Uh, with Blizzard, though, it's definitely a risk right now because you get in range and pew pew, Nephi's dead. But uh, I, I think there's some interesting things in here, but probably, again, not something that I would restructure 600 of my points out of my army to fit this in. I think there might be other regiments of renown that might fill that slot a little better. Maddie, anything final? No. All right, I think we both agree. Um, next one is our brand new Summer King's Entourage. So this is uh, Ushoran, the new Mortark for Flesh Eater Courts, the Mortark of Delusion. The model is currently unavailable, so who knows when it comes out, but uh, maybe this will inspire you to go pick it up. Uh, you'll also get 10 Crypt Guard, which are a part of the new um, the box that came out a, a, a month ago, as well as the three Morbeck Knights, which is um, they're a super interesting uh, army. And definitely anyone who's seen like Facebook on the buy and sell, people are trying to get their hands on more Morbeck Knights. So very popular unit choice. But what do I get? I get my six up ward, as I've already mentioned. I get the Maddening uh, Radiance, where you add one to the attack characteristic of melee weapons used by this unit uh, in the Regiment of Renown, while they're wholly within sh within 12 inches of Ashoran, um, as well as um, you, at the end of your movement phase, if the Ashoran is in this Regiment of Renown is on the battlefield, 
you can pick one surf or one knight unit so the crypt guard are serfs the morbeg knights are knights uh, in this regiment of renown they're destroyed you add the unit uh, identically to the battlefield set it up wholly within six inches of a battle edge more than nine inches from all enemy units and you can only replace them once so essentially for 670 points i'm getting a shorin uh 10 crypt guard three more big knights and i can replace those units once each not Ushorin, obviously, but the Crypt Guard and the Morbeck Knights. Uh, anyone can take this other than Flesh Eater Courts. What's our thoughts on this one? It's a lot of damage. Um, Ushuran is normally... A lot of his abilities revolve around the Feck Allegiance abilities. Um, the Delusion Swapping, for example, that's not going to work here. Um, his Feeding Frenzy ability also isn't going to work here, but Maddening Radiance is effectively free Feeding Frenzy. Um, it's on mm. all the time. Um, so it really is a lot of damage between him and the Crypt Guard and the Knights. Um, and the fact that the Recursion is a full unit instead of just a half unit means you are getting a lot of value out of those hammers. Um, 300 points? Uh, is it more big knights so are 160, 170, and Crypt Guards 140? Don't quote me on this. This is purely like memory. That. This is purely memory, but it's about 300 points of value getting full replacements rather than half, which is crazy. Yeah. Um, so it's definitely like if you're just looking for pure raw damage, these do put it out. Um, the problem is, I'm not sure if anyone necessarily needs just damage um, because it, it's not going to synergize with any of your allegiance abilities, any of your buff spells. Um, it's not super tanky, which doesn't really matter because they come back. Um, but it's just they hit things. That's about it. Yeah, th um, this one this one does what it says on the box. Ashurin as a model does a lot of damage. The Morbeck Knights will do some good damage, and they can shut off Unleash Hell, if I remember correctly. Uh, can, the Crypt yes, Guard are going to give you... And shut off Unleash Hell. Yeah, which is super nice. Um, the Crypt Guard can do some decent damage and they get plus one to ward rolls for, for a hero. So if you position Ushuran correctly, you could be giving him a plus one to his ward roll, which is quite nice. Um, it puts him and, on a four up, so it's it's strong. Um, it's, you do have to like wounds? bubble wrap him, though. So he's 16, 20 wounds? I can't remember how. He's somewhere between 16 and 20 wounds. Yeah. E He's more than a he's more than a traditional Mortark, but I don't remember if he was the same as uh Canacross. I think he's I think twenty. Yeah, somewhere like that. Um but yeah, OBR not starved for damage at all. Feck, you know, can't take him. Um Nighthold? Nighthaunt, maybe. He's not going to proc Wave of Terror, uh, but they do have damage problems. Um, and they do have some base rend. It's not a lot, um, but they'll, they'll chew things up. Um, the Terrified in Nighthaunt also synergizes nicely with Usharan's um, bravery debuffing. Because he's got that uh, minus one to bravery for everything within three inches of him in combat uh, permanently. Um, I think he has 16 minutes. I mean, yeah. I, I, I think he it's heals just, a lot as well. Not, yeah. I, he his heals, war scrolls not. It's, it's less. Yeah. His war scrolls not in the app, and I, I'm, I'm not near the book. So it's somewhere between 16 and 20. I, I, I think it's 16. Before. Yeah. Okay. Um, but yeah, he heals himself. 
I think there's some play in Nighthaunt. If you're if you're looking Maybe. for some damage, and look, look, regardless, all of these uh, regiments of renown are going to lose the synergy, right? Regardless, so we've got to take them for yeah. what they are. We've well, got I to think take some them have, you know, like their own synergy, you know, um, like Usharan's bravery debuff, you know, that brings something into Nighthaunt that they've always had terrified, but no way to really capitalize on that. Um, but, you know, this could be a way to do that. And I think d d a point you made earlier on as well is that these are discounted and 100% you are discounted because I think you and I both agree that Mortarks are not your, they're not Archaeon. They are not a, uh, they're not Gordrak. They are not a centerpiece that you run forward and you win with on their own. They are force multipliers and you see that their synergies are far greater in combination. Um, you've already alluded to, to the Legion of Blood. So seeing Neferata, she is so much better. And while you don't see Neferata outside of uh, Legion of Blood very often, um, someone like Manfred is a little bit better uh, being a solo operator. But for most parts, they have to act within their, their keyword. And probably why you're getting a discount, because Ashuran, I think, was like 450, 500. So She's a lot. Yeah. So, but, but but you're getting in this combination ten crypt guard and three more big knights, and you're getting them back once per per battle each, um, at full strength. So that's a lot of value from this combination. And I think it's easy to sort of, you know, when you're looking at all of them, and they're they're all discounted a little bit, but with those extra units, the sheer value in this one is particularly high and just like units you're getting for those points yeah yeah i i like it for that and i think you're gonna get some good damage out of ashoran um and the morbeg knights i think they'll surprise you and you can trade them off a little bit and you you know you get them back so you don't have to be as protective with them yeah speaking of manny uh here is manfred and friends so the um you'll get manfred you'll get 10 grave guard you'll get two units of three fell bats again you can't take this if you are soul black grave lords but you can take them everyone else uh you obviously get your six up ward you get plus one attack characteristic for weapons used by units in this regiment of renown that was set up in the same turn what does that mean well cover of night at the start of your hero phase you can pick one unit in this regiment of renown that is more than three inches from all enemy units so not in combat remove that unit from the battlefield and set it up again more than six inches from all enemy units that unit cannot move in the following movement phase 630 points for many and friends what do, what do we think of this one this one i actually think is good um manfred is actually a pretty good ally. Um, he's fast, decently heady, heals, um, and his counter charge is very strong. Um, I've seen him sometimes in Night Hunt just on his own, um, and he's, he's quite good. Um, he's a little bit, I think, less of just force multiplier than the others. Um, and then the units he comes with are also really nice here. Uh, Grave Guard hit like a truck, uh, and they do mortal wounds, which is something that, um, you know, not every army has access to. Uh, so this could be a way, um, for, you know, armies like Feck or Nighthaunt that have very low rend and no mortal wounds to punch through high armor saves. Um... OBR has a lot of rend, but they still don't really have mortal wound damage. Um, uh, fell bats are great for, you know, harassment, scoring, surround and destroy, screening, whatever. Uh, super versatile unit, super great. Um, and then the combination of Cover and Night and Engulfing Shadows. Cover and Night, already a great ability on its own. Um, giving even more mobility to Manfred, to the bats. They can be anywhere they want, anytime, basically. Um, but then for the Grave Guard, getting to teleport them six inches away and have plus one attacks, your opponent needs to watch their back line 
or it's going to explode. Um, one thing Can Graveguard I have historically been missing is a good delivery mechanism. And this is a good delivery mechanism. Good, Maddie, good. This is automatic. You automatically yeah. charge. You automatically yeah. charge because the musician counts yep. charge rolls that are less as than a six. six. As six. You have it, guaranteed your so, charge. Like. <laughs> not only is it a guaranteed charge, it's they get buffed for doing it. And you can buff them even more. When you look at Manfred's uh, yeah. profile, you've got the uh, sort of unholy power. Um, yep. If he does some, if he slays an enemy model, uh, now mind you, that means that you let the grave guard then get fought, which in that case, usually you, with a unit of 10 grave guard, I probably would want them to fight first. But if you find yourself in a position, you could actually get an extra attack as well through the sort of unholy power. I just wouldn't recommend it. But um, the plus option. one attack on grave guard is probably going to delete whatever they touch anyway yeah so yeah uh it's a good little it's a, that 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 in itself is this little combination is this is this is why i would bring this list like man this is, is a good super on himself. good regiment to bring on, i think it's got damage it's got utility it's got harassment i could see putting this in honestly any of the factions that can take it um i don't think it's ever a bad choice I think it has something to add for all of them. And I think what it adds for all of them is a little bit different. Um, you know, like in OBR, I think you're using it more as a techie piece. Um, you want basically the threat of the grave guard coming from behind while the rest of your army marches forward. You want the bats for, you know, going out on side objectives or scoring surround and destroy something OBR can't normally do very well. Um, you know, Manfred's running around, casting spells, standing on things, hitting small foot heroes with Archon. Um, versus Night Haunt, you know, they also definitely want the Grave Guard for hitting things, but they probably want more support. Um, Felbats are good with a uh, Wave of Terror because uh, they're benefiting from those minus one to saves. So all their two damage attacks can actually get through uh, if, you know, a couple of Nightheart units charge and give something minus two to save. Like, suddenly those bats are on Ren 2 and actually getting damage. Um, Even with Phil Bats, like, being able to do Surround and Destroy, like, first, like, they, yep. they are two units that are super fast that can help Teleport you Teleport around. Yeah, but they can help you, sell, you know, because most yep. armies don't have the units to do Surround and Destroy. It's a big sacrifice. These are fast, they're agile, you get them in, you swing them back in uh, while the rest of your force like walks up and, and go see their friends in the middle of the board. Manfred's counter charge, um, you know, you can use it offensively to go hunt something down when you get charged, or, you know, you can use it defensively. Um, you know, Night Hunt really doesn't like being charged. Maybe the first unit charges in and you go send Manfred to go tie up the other units that were going to charge. Um, and, you know, then sort of they have a choice, too. Do they attack uh, with the unit they charged with first to try to go kill your unit um, before it hits them back? Or um, a lot of times you can set up a situation with your counter charge where you can pile out of combat with one of the units you tagged um, and just go hit a different one. Um, and then they're going to be losing that damage um, so you can force them into some tough situations. Even being able to stop somebody from their battle tactics, like you kill battle a thing, right? Battle tactics stopping, yep. Like, like they've buffed up their unit for, for spells and, and abilities. Yeah, yeah like, like straight away you go, cool. Okay, you're going yep. to charge this unit into this unit to go kill them. Guess what? Manny's going to counter no, charge you. No, because yeah. Manny's going to tie you up, stop you from getting into that unit or making you make a long bomb charge with another unit that maybe isn't as buffed up so there's a lot of really good play in this one and um one that i would yeah i think we both agree this is definitely one that we would see people using competitively i think this is a really good option yeah the the cover of night with the great guard is just ridiculous it's like so that, good 
The amount of times I've seen someone put their grave guard in a grave site, go for the nine inch charge, fail it, re-roll it, fail it, and then those grave guard are just sitting there. I can either Next avoid button. them, shoot them, like do nothing. This is a guarantee. This is as guarantee it's as you really can get. Good. Yeah. Uh, there's no fail. There's literally no fail. You hit them just outside of six, you you can't fail this. What you could maybe fail, and no, I actually don't know, this actually, I think we both like this one too, uh, is Arken the Black with uh, his friends of two Morgast Archai and two Morgast Harbringers. So uh, this being an Ossiarch Bone Reapers uh, a Regiment of Renown, you can take them anywhere outside of uh, Ossiarch Bone Reapers. You do get the six up ward, surprise the century. You get Unholy Sacraments, where you can roll the dice each time a friendly unit in this Regiment of Renown. Basically, it's Null Myriad. I'm just going to fast forward this. It's Null Myriad. <laughs> you basically, if a unit is affected by a spell or an endless spell it's on a two up, it's Null Myriad. It's, it's Null Myriad. Um, well, they don't have with, to be within range of Archon. They still that get I was going to say, like, oh, yeah, yeah, without the conditions of having to be within nine inches of an idiot. Uh, but it is the most one of the most expensive ones. So 750 points. Uh, that is almost half of your army going into five models. It's steep. They're very good units, though. Um, Archon, uh, again, you know, fast, durable monster, heals himself. Uh, he's a little less hitty than the other two mounted Mortarks, but he can still clear some stuff. Um, great caster. Being a triple caster is a little bit of an issue in a regiment because you're running out of spells to cast um, since you don't get any lore spells. So either you're casting Bolt, Shield, and um, Curse of Ears every turn, or... Maybe you bring endless spells. Um, you know, I could see him as like a caster for Purple Sun and Night Hunt. Um, what does do a lot of damage is Morgasts. Um, Archai are good. They get a five up ward if they're sitting around Archon. Uh, Harbingers are less good. They have a deep strike. It's bad. Uh, you won't use it like ever because it's. Remember when we talked about Graveyard, you know, setting up inside nine inches, re-rolling the charge, doing nothing? That's Harbingers. They have no bonus to charge, so they just don't get in. Um, you've got less than 50% odds there, even with the re-roll. So it's just generally not a good play. Um, rules is written. You also can't set them up there in the first place because uh, the Regiment of Renown Battalion... Uh, requires them to be set up um, like all in a group and if one of them is in deep strike that they're not in a group um, but the gets one has the same problem and that yeah. hasn't been fixed so um, I doubt this will be either but, they, uh, but the, the Harbringers do have that really good rule where you can shut off um, commands within yeah, three inches. Both more like ghasts shut off commands within three inches. And they have strike first if they roll an eight up on the charge. So also they hit like trucks. Um, you get to choose which weapon loadout you have on these, which I think is a first. I believe all the previous regiments of Renown had preset weapon loadouts, but you do get to choose here. You could have either swords, which are... Five attacks, threes and threes, one run, two damage. Or glaives, which are um, three attacks, threes and threes, two run, three damage. Um, the glaives are usually what you're going to want to be taking, but swords aren't bad. Uh, they're just better against like chaff units. Yeah, I, I always um, put halberd. I always put halberds on my on my morgast. I, just I think halberds are generally better, and I think in the regiment you always want to do halberds. OBR specifically has enough trouble dealing with hordes where there's a case for swords. But I think in here you always pick the halberds. Um, but they are such a solid unit. They turn off commands, so that's effectively giving them an extra pip of rend because you can't all at defense. Um, you know, you can't all at attack, so it gives them extra durability. No inspiring presence. 
Um, they shot off Unleash Hell. They're just a super solid unit. Um, and then having the Null Myriad, you know, two up spell ignore um, means they can go in, eat castles without needing to worry about getting blizzarded. Um, just very solid. Um, and then Archon can heal them too. I was going to say there's two other things I'd call out with Arkan. The first one is the fact that he's automatically healing them three wounds. Um, yep. and, and another thing that maybe is worth considering for anyone for this particular army on how you might benefit from this is the rule first of the Mortarx where you add six inches to the range of spell cast by death, friendly death wizards while they're wholly within 18 inches of this unit. So... Um, that's an interesting rule of thinking about how you might extend your range or extending some of the benefits and thinking about what you've got in your army and you know if you need that benefit um it, obviously you don't take it just purely for that but um being a triple cast is interesting you might be able to unbind an endless spell and still have two spell casts or he's at uh, plus two also so having plus two unbinds you know three of them um you know can be good can be good anti-magic also yeah is this worth 750 though like would you would you restructure an army you are an obl girl obr girl um would you if you were running Fle flesh eater courts or nighthorn or soul blight would you allocate almost a thousand of your points to these five units i think five I models five models not units units five home. models um i think it pairs fairly nicely um Archon's a different option uh, to Midnight Tome for getting the purple sun off. It's not guaranteed, but it's repeatable. Um, sadly, the spell ignore is only for ones cast by enemies. So you do have to be careful with your own purple sun or, you know, it'll affect you too. Um, but I do think having that repeatableness and the anti-magic that comes with it is nice. Uh, and I think more guests also... Um, pair very nicely. They do that high rend damage um, that Night Hunt doesn't really have a lot of natively. They turn off all out defense, which again, that's basically like an extra wave of terror proc. Um, when all, you know, if you've got like Herodons or something, um, no base rend, but you know, maybe you get like minus two to save. Uh, it's nice to have them actually at minus two to save and not save stacked back up. Mm. Um, same, you know, turning off Unleash Hell. Night Hunt doesn't really have that natively either. So um, being able to safely get into a shooting castle without half your, you know, Blade Guys, Herodons, whatever, uh, dying in the meantime. Um, that's very good. Um, 750 points is steep, but I think it might be worth it. I'd want to play with it um, before like making a decision but i think i think it could be good i could see it i could see it in flesh eater courts as well because you you know they're not the strongest magic uh army in death and they're definitely also with the speed the more gas would play nicely with their base move of 10 and being able to do some other things as you mentioned shutting down uh all that defense um because they have really good volumes of attacks as well so again but now we're talking about two ghoul kings on terror geist sword or uh, oshoran and some morbeg knights it's a sizable chunk and i think that uh, the morbeg knights also sort of play a little bit in the same space as the morgasts um you know they're not quite the same um and you know they can't shut off commands but that sort of like fast high damage like shock unit uh, and they also turn off the Unleash Hell. Um, so I think they could work there, but I think that their role is a little bit less niche. The the the, the portable Null Myriad, this two-up, ignore the effects of spells and endless spells. Let's see where the, the Battle Scroll takes us. And obviously Seraphon has risen to power quite significantly. Uh, does Blizzard change at all? There's some play in here. It's just the question is, is 750 the right price for you to get some of these yeah. abilities? Like, if you play into corn, so what? Like, great, you've just lost literally the one ability from the this, and you're relying on the benefits of the war scroll. Is it enough? 
I'll leave it up to you. Solid, solid horse crawls. Um, I think that this one, more than any, is relying on just sort of pure unit quality. Um, I think that the spelling nor is more of a nice little bonus than what the draw of this regiment is. Agreed. And that goes back to me. Do you need the Morgasts? You know, they've got good movement. They're base saver four. They've got six wounds. They've got some really nice abilities. If you see benefit in those Morgasts, then this is for you. If you're like, eh, I've got something in my army that can do better, or oh, I don't really quite need that rule, then you probably don't want to pay 750 for this combination. That's really like, you're right. It, it, the quality of unit, the ability is just cream on the top. For sure. And it's discounted because this would be a very expensive one. One that would be really expensive is this one. Special K, Catacross, and two units of three Immortus Guards. Uh, this would be worth like a 1,000 points. It's coming to you discounted today at a low, low price of 750 uh, Same deal as... forty would be the, the total. It is the highest discount out of all of them. It's a very generous discount. Uh, although you probably argue as well, the flesh eater courts one getting two you could argue for three the is courts, probably yeah. also a cheapy. But what do you get for it? So you get special K, you get two units of three and mortis guard. Uh, you have your six up ward as per normal. Uh, you have the bulwark of the necropol necropolis, uh, where enemy models that have a wounds characteristic of three or less cannot contest objectives while they are within six inches of any models in this regiment of renown. 750. That's it. And probably much like what we just said about with Arcan and friends, um, you are really working on the quality of the War Scroll. And anyone who's been keeping across the meta has seen how much uh, Immortus Guard have been terrorizing people. Uh, granted, it's not a unit of six, they are two units of three, but still very good quality War Scrolls. Maddie, how do we feel about this one? I like two units of three. I run two units of three in my OBR list. Um, but I feel like the units here definitely suffer from the lack of OBR allegiance abilities. Um, Catacross, you know, he's a good force multiplier, but he's not force multiplying much, which is why it's so steeply discounted. And a lot of his abilities are still good. Um, you know, getting that minus one to hit uh, any target of your choice on the whole board, strong. Command point denying, strong. Um, he's got a free command once per turn. Um, he's going to be using that for his own command on your turn. Um, and then whatever you want, really, on your opponents. Um, healing for the Immortus Guard. He's hidden against heroes. Um, what but I think his big feel? value in OBR is really that force multiplying. And he doesn't really do a lot of that here it's kind of just buffing him in the immortus guard which is exactly exactly being my point right it's like you rarely see catacross at the yeah. front of the lines um he's always in the back like the quarterback swinging and supporting where yeah. required what's the value to me if i'm night haunt flesh eater courts or soul blight with someone like catacross you definitely do want him up there swinging uh, you just don't want him bogged down but if you can get him within three inches of a hero, he hits like a truck. Um, a lot of times, you know, people will have like a little support hero, a little too close to the front line. And, you know, you charge and it's within three and he just eviscerates whatever he touches. Um, Immortus guard, they bodyguard for him, but honestly, you don't want them anywhere near him because that's just getting unnecessary damage on your Immortus guard. Um, I think the Immortus are a little awkward here, too. Uh, their fight twice is a command, which you can't fight twice both outside of OBR, because if you take him outside of OBR, you're limited to the, um, you can't use a command twice in the same uh, phase restriction. So you can't fight twice them both in the same phase. Um, and you're going to be a little bit shorter on command points than OBR. Plus, outside of OBR, they don't have plus three inches to move. They don't have retreat and charge. 
So they're really, really slow. Mm. Um, they're like, you know, people say, oh, OBR is slow a lot, but it ends up not really being slow because of all their commands. These are slow. Cat moves four inches. Like, you're basically getting Gotrek here. Mm. Um, but even against heroes, he doesn't hit as hard as Gotrek. Uh, and the Immortus Guard move five, so similar issue there. Um, no charge bonuses on either. It's that um, bulwark of the Necropolis that really stands out for me. Being able to it's shut so off people. funny to me. Because Why? what OBR struggles to deal with, like, most, is hordes of chaff. And, like, our iconic regiment of renown. What is it good at? Hordes of chaff. This is hilarious to me. Like, OBR would take something with that ability, like, in a heartbeat. Uh, one of our endless spells uh, does it for wounds characteristic two or less, and it's it's really good. OBR um, definitely needs all the help it can get at this point. Like, just like, you're, <laughs> struggle, you're struggling so yeah. much. You need to shut off a, poor, objective poor control on some of everything else. But it kind of plays into the slow defense, right? Is that being able to, hell, you got a, a, a backfield objective you need to protect, have three Immortus Guard yeah. in the back. Unless you've got more wounds than three, uh, you cannot steal onto that objective and it plays into the the speed and the double fight. And uh, It's so expensive, though, that you can't yeah. really afford to have them just sitting on a back objective. Like, you really need to be getting in there with them otherwise that's 750 points of your army that's just sitting there and for some of the uh, objectives as well where like there's a pulse or maybe you could turn things off all of a sudden for that uh immortus guard to get from one objective to another it could be two turns yeah. five inch movement is just it's kind of brutal my thoughts and prayers are with uh, my osteoc bone reaper movement characteristic <laughs> do, well, do you take in it obr you know Everything's got plus three, so it's it's fine. Here, okay. here it's harsh. Outside of your OBR crutch, are you taking this in another army? Probably not, no. Um, I don't think it's awful, but I think it's just too expensive for what it's what it's giving you. I, I'd like to see this without Catacross. Give me another hero. And actually, it would have been quite nice if it was this and Arcan, given that Arcan has the ability to support a Mortis Guard with um, his auto um, regeneration ability. Um, yeah. I, I mean, uh, yeah, I, I think, yeah, you're, I think you're right. Like, it's a really cool rule, the Necropolis, but 750 um, and the speed or the lack of speed uh, does make it. Because I imagine someone who picks this book up for the first time goes, oh, I hear a lot about OBR and how powerful they are. I'm going to grab this. Everyone's talking about uh, about uh, a mortis guard. Actually, probably not the right not the right combination because of the lack of allegiance. But it does have some good things. If you wanted to run them, you probably could do okay. Um, but it's probably not the optimum value for your seven hundred and fifty point investment. And I personally would struggle to define where I would put this. Like flesh eater quartz doesn't need it. Night Hort probably doesn't need this. I think there are other regiments that are probably better suited for Nighthorn if you're struggling yeah. a little. Um, it's cool, but I, I, I don't value it as it much as some of the others. Yeah. Yeah. All right. It's interesting. I think we both agree. Interesting, uh, but probably not the most optimum choice. The last one, and I can't wait for this discussion, is going to be Alinda. So Lady Alinda uh, with 10 Dread Scythe Harridans, two units of four Miamon Banshees. Uh, they do bring the uh, Ethereal Rule, which is fantastic. So they have a six-up ward. They uh, can still retreat and charge in the same turn. There's an error I've got to pick up. They, they definitely don't character in the same turn, uh, but people watching this video will not see that mistake. Uh, they also ignore mo modifiers, both positive and negative, to save rolls. So... Uh, no surprise there. You also have the Harvester of Sorrow. So in the Battleshock phase, enemy units cannot issue or receive commands while they are within three inches of any units in his Regiment of Renown. 
In addition, if you make an unmodified charge roll of eight plus for this for a unit in this regiment of renown, the strike first effect applies to that unit until the end of the turn, 630. So one of the cheaper ones, uh, but the combination might justify why it's so cheap. Yeah, I think despite being cheap, it's cheap because it doesn't do much. The Regiment of Renown's abilities are basically just putting them back to baseline Night Haunt status, um, but with weird Wave of Terror. You know, it's simplified. It's just eight up for Strike First, um, which maybe if they could give minus one to save, that'd be neat. But Strike First on Olinder, who doesn't hit super hard um, and isn't super tanky. Herodons, which are the one thing here that like you really do want to be getting into combat like aggressively. Um, you know, they're four attacks each. Uh, if something's damaged, they'll be threes and threes, no rend, one damage. So just that weight of dice. Uh, and then Banshees, which do actually hit fairly hard, but they melt like paper um so i don't know that the strike first is like a particularly helpful replacement for wave of terror um and then the units themselves but they can but they, but they, but they do shut off uh, uh, commands right they can't issue or receive commands which i think is quite battle shock phase that, Oh, the battleship phase, damn it. Yeah. That's... If it was if it was all phases, we'd have something. But it's just effectively no inspiring presence. I should uh, I should read I should read the, the screen before I jump into a conclusion. <laughs> I'm like, oh, oh it says there. Because I'm what I'm doing at the moment is while you're talking, is I'm going, right, well, Alinda is probably the reason why I'm taking this, right? Everyone loves a mortar, she's a beautiful model. But what does a Linda bring to me, right? You know, double caster, a native four plus ward, obviously ignores rend, which is fantastic. Um, can shut off some commands when you issue within 12 inches. Um, there's the lifting of the veil once per battle. Uh, once once per battle, you can retain a bunch of, oh no, no sorry, lifting the veil is every turn. It's the um, no rest for the wicked. That is once per battle where you can add an extra D6 slain models to uh, your night hot summonables. And then grief stricken is is a, is a decent spell as well. So, um, but she's not a ta like she's like what does she do? She's a support piece. She's a, she's a, support, a support wizard. Piece. Yeah, and her spell like minus one to hit. Even if you discount the plus one to hit part, um, which you know your heroines can still get in. Um, they'll already have plus one to hit. But I guess if you're sending her or the banshees in, but minus one to hit even on its own is still like fine. Uh, she's a double caster, so she'll have a second spell. Um, chip damage, you know, uh, lifting the veil is nice because it can trigger the Herodin's bloodlust. Um, it's just a shame, no just, to inter just to interrupt you really quickly, the only thing is that with the lifting of the veil, uh, none of the units will be terrified, right? So she's not going to get the yep. plus one to the mortal wound. So you kind of yep. lose a little there. Um. There's just a little bit of, it's clunky. Um, same no for, for uh, no rest for the wicked. Yeah, it's also a little clunky here because you've got ten harridans, and two units of four banshees. Those aren't surviving like anything that touches them. So I think it's going to be kind of hard for her to get any value out of that. Maybe if something gets into the Herodons, a couple of them live, but like the Banshees probably aren't living. Um, you're probably burning that quickly. Like that's like, like in yeah. a night haunt, in a night haunt army, you probably burn that ability round three or round four. This is probably like a round two type burn it. Uh, it's whenever you need it, basically. Like yeah. use it right away because they won't last long enough for you to use it again. Because they're only one uh -huh. wound. That, 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 that's the challenge, yeah. folks. If you haven't looked at like a, a meme on Banshee, um, they're only one wound. So um, it doesn't take much to kill them if you get into them and you focus. You don't even need to focus, you know, like chip damage. Just And to be fair, 
it's a little bit hard to chip damage them down um, because of their unbind ability. Um, they've got very good anti-magic, um, where if you cast a spell and target something, um, holy with 12 of them, they get to try to unbind it. Uh, and they only have to roll above the casting value of the spell, not what you rolled. Um, so no matter how many, you know, pluses you have to cast, no matter how many primal dice you dump into that, um, they've still got their shot at unbinding it. Mm. The problem is they still can't do much about, like, Blizzard, because the casting value on that's a 12. Um, they they can they can they can let me pull my hand up for a second because they do get plus one to the roll if the unit has three, three or more models yeah so there is that technically can yeah yeah like, there's like that cards. one percent chance if you roll the double the double six you could stop blizzard but uh, you, you but don't it's bank unlikely. on that yeah you don't bank it's like a two percent they do stack too um if you're in range of two units of banshees both get to try to unbind it. The problem with this is like, who wants this? You know, Soul Blight likes Banshees, but they can just ally Banshees in normally, and they're like seventy points, like eighty points, eighty points, I think. Um, ninety, they're ninety at the moment. Ninety, ninety. That's what that's what that's what's saying on the app. They're ninety points. Okay. Still, still two, two cheap. units. Two like, units is super cheap. Yeah, one hundred eighty points. Or I could uh, reinforce them right to make them a unit of eight. You can. Um, I don't think it's generally right to reinforce them because, again, they stack. So having two units has two chances of unbinding everything. And it also makes them less vulnerable to something getting into them. Um, because it means, you know, people would have to split attacks. But, yeah, Soul Blight can just take them normally. And it's so much cheaper and you don't have to pay for Olind or Inheritance, which aren't really doing anything. Um, OBR doesn't want to pay for this. 630 points. No. We have no Myriad anyway. Like, we just don't need it. Feck, Feck maybe could use the anti-magic, but, like, what are they really doing with this? You know, like, it's just not worth, I don't think, the price you're paying for the entire package of a kind of okay support piece inheritance which can be a hammer but like would need hoarfrost um or like minuses to save or something on the enemy because otherwise they have no rend and then the anti-magic pieces that are actually good um so i just can't really see anyone taking it no, I think I think the unit choice was off. I would rather them drop the Haridans and maybe even some of the. I mean, even if they kept the Banshees, like give me something useful, whether it's some Stalkers, whether it's some Reapers, even some Chain Rasps. Like put put Chain Rasp, like a unit of twenty Chain Rasps, or drop the point to make it a unit of ten. Are I, 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 Stalkers I, and useful in the same sentence? I'm just saying Haridans are not that useful. Like I'm trying. I'm just but give me a, give me a Black Coach. Give me the uh, Black Coach. I could I could have been worse. I could have said, "Give me some uh, cross boots." I think glaive raid stalkers are potentially like the worst unit in Night Hunt. They're so bad. The damage too. You could haul frost them. <sighs> three three threes rend rend three for two damage. That's not bad. They're one attack, one attack each. It's one attack. That that's not, let me finish. They're that. one attack. <laughs> you get so three bad. Shot. I know that that is bad. <laughs> That is bad. Uh, I'll, I'll give you that much. <laughs> but, but there's 70 points, like 70 points that are oh, four, uh, four. Okay, I'll, all right, I'll take that back. I'll, I'll take that back. That's a bad, bad mistake. I'd rather have the cross boost. I'd rather just take the triumph. <laughs> or that, but, yeah. All right, so this one, uh, not not the best. Like Not the one that we're probably going to rush out and again, go win LVO with. No, probably not. No. All right. 
So we've gone through all of the regimens of renown, and if you've held on for this long, we are going to reward you with a treat, and that is Madigan's fun list when it comes to that army of renown we spoke about a little earlier. So remember, we have some restrictions, doggos, bats, and vampires with 12 wounds or less. Uh, we give up all of our artifacts and command traits and all the things like uh, our grand strategies. Uh, this is really playing with the army of renown. So uh, I did challenge Batty and I said, look, if you were going to run this at your local game store, what would you, you create? And this is what we've got. So it is that that scions of Nalmiria, Nalmiria, New Lamia. Um, the grand strategy is the Baron Ice Scapes from the General's Handbook. Uh, I have no idea what the triumph actually was. I just picked it off from a previous video. So it could be tri inspired. It could be anything. Uh, but you will get the Bloodseeker Palaquin with Levitate. You'll get Kato. You'll get a Coven Throne with Flaming Weapon. You'll get two Vampire Lords on foot. One with Blizzard, one with Hoarfrost, uh, a Vengorian Lord, which is the General, Flaming Weapon, Crown of Command, three units of ten Doggos, three units of, of three Bats, uh, wrapping up in a tidy 1990 points. So given all of the restrictions, Maddie, that we've talked about with the Armies of Renown, what's the thinking behind this particular list and why the combination that you've picked? I think if you're going to play the army of renown you kind of want to be playing the big vampires like you're here for the fluff you're here for fun you're here to have your big vampires kill heroes and get plus one attacks and maybe you can pull off your palanquin combo where you know the palanquin's giving up plus one attacks from its ability and plus one attacks from your um your plot um so Palanquin, Coven Throne, Vingorian Lord, they're the closest thing you have to hammers in uh, the army of renown. Um, Kato, again, really good here because he's not supposed to benefit from sub factions, but gets away with it here because it's not a sub faction. Um, so he can get like plus two to cast um, from the uh, uh, Legion of Blood ability that. I'm blanking on and his own ability um which is nice or you know the attacks also benefit him um two vampire lords blizzard and hoarfrost just good spells i would probably put them in acolytes um hoarfrost nice palanquins whatever um blizzard always solid um and again, if you try to do all big vampires, uh, you know, I wanted to do like two Palanquins, two Coven Thrones, because that's fun, you know? Um, but you run out of spells so quickly. So I think you really want those smaller vampire lords um, so that you can get Lord Primal Frost spells. Um, Vingorian Lord, General with flaming weapon, uh, the artifact, and the command trait, which isn't listed, but should be on there. Um, again, since all your recursion is tied to your general, you probably want it the tankiest thing you have, because if it goes down, all of your summonable recursion goes down. Mm. And then just some wolves, some bats. That's what you get for non-hero units, so that's what we're adding. Why not just like really double down on the dogs? Like go go hard and get them into units of twenty or even thirty. I like that. Why not reinforce them? Why, why not reinforce them in sixes? You definitely could. Um, I like bats in threes more because it's easier for them to sort of do just harassment. You know, go off in a corner, surround and destroy. Like. I think if I was going to reinforce one of them, it would be the wolves. Um, you do have five battle line here because of the vampire lords. So, um, you know, if you I was going to ask you about that, I was going to yeah. ask you about that. Like, why? Like, is there a reason why, or could you drop ten doggos or make a unit of twenty and still fulfill battle line because yeah, the vampire lords? You can merge them, um, but I feel like you're a little bit short then on wolves to like move around screen your stuff um so i think i'd rather have them in the separate units but i think 20 and 10 is also a consideration um 
And, you know, if they die, you just bring them back. So, oh, well. But When you look at the list, it really just reminds you how restrictive it is. Like, I look at it and go, so man, I want, some, I want some blood knights or some black knights. Give me some skellies. Give me some, uh, give me, like, there's all these things where it's like, like my mom's just saying to me, no, 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 you can't have this. You have doggos and bats at home. You cannot eat that delicious burger. Like, oh, it's, I, was, I just want the grave guard. Give me some grave guard. And then I look at that um, that Manfred Regiment of Renown where I get it's the free so teleport. Cool. Like, I yeah. just want that. Give me that. Um, it's a fun list. Like, again, we, we have made no secret that this is not the most competitive build. Uh, you are trading off some things for uh, some interesting new rules. But would I take it to my next grand tournament and go go 5-0? and oh? Uh, not unless I'm an ultra chat and I'm trying to prove a point. And uh, if you do it, if you want a major event with this and uh, you tell me and, like, it's, I don't know, 40, 50, 50 people, five five game tournament, uh, I'll definitely want to talk to you on how on earth you bribed people to give you the win because uh, I don't think you're going 5-0. and oh. But, who you knows, maybe you're a better player than I am. Prove me wrong. <laughs> prove me wrong. I don't even think it's awful. Like, I don't think it 5-0 is out of question but i think it's so much worse than standard soul blight why would you you know yeah you're putting a cap on yourself it's like there's things that i just want to have like the spell law like if i had the spell law the from spell law is huge yeah if i had the spell law i think my opinion changes a little because i'm like look you know there's all these wizards who benefit from spells at least now i can make the most of all the wizards in my army but right now i'm probably sacrificing a lot of my spells um or i'm relying on the crutch which is a general's handbook three spells where normally i wouldn't have three spells in a general's handbook i'd have one yeah i think the spells are the biggest thing for me too because a lot of the other things you're giving up you know like it might be worse competitively but you know again it's fluffy it's fun I feel like the spells are like hindering even trying to build fun fluffy lists um, because it just locks your hero selection down so much. Like it's again, three spells. It's four three coven spells. drones would be super fun, but you have the generic spells only for them. It's three spells, Soul Pike, yeah. Spirit Gale, and Valtra. It's not like we're giving them 12 new spells. It's three. Just give them the three spells. Just give them three. I, I do wish um, they had those, yeah. And let me have 14 wound vampires. Give me my give me my Vlozda and let me run three Vlozdas and that'll be funny as all hell. It'll do decently. It's not going to 5 and 0, but just let me run three Vlozdas. Yeah. I feel like there was, I don't know, definitely a lot of potential that could have been there that just list bowling restrictions make it really awkward to build not only competitive lists, but like a lot of my ideas for like fun, fluffy lists for it too, were also kind of stymied by them. Yeah, we, we were talking earlier um, and I was saying, you know, like I'd love Blood Knights, right? If this is like a, a bit more vampire-y, like, let me have Blood Knights. And I feel like maybe they were a bit conservative on pulling the trigger because then it's leaning into Castellai, which is meant to be the Blood Knight faction. And I, I understand that, right? But, like, I feel like being too restrictive has stopped maybe exploring parts of this book in a very different way, you know. Um, yeah, they got the plots. But anyway, look, Madigan, how are you feeling about death in general? Let's like let's just bring this home and summarize it. Forget about like by the way, if you, you know, the, the Mad King Rises, great book. We talked about the stories, a lot of fun, interesting builds. Um, you know, if you've played at LVO or CanCon or you've got, you know, you're looking for something a bit more variety uh, as the battle scroll comes out, you've now got some options. Uh, maybe a justification to go out and buy uh, the start of your next death faction and start with the the regiment of renown. So um, could be inspiration into the next season. But how are you feeling overall as a death player? Are you feeling like you are in a good stead? Are you concerned about anything coming from the battle scroll? Um, anything you want to say to your, your fellow Nagashites? Uh, I mean, obviously, battle scroll, soul blade, and OBR might take a hit again. Uh, hopefully, you know, hopefully, Night Haunt gets a little something. Um, I'm thinking the regiments of renown also 
you know, might give him a little boost. Um, maybe there's some builds there. Um, as a death player, I think the thing I'm most hyped about here, I'm really excited to play the narrative campaigns in it, like the Triumph and Treachery, um, the Battle of the Mortarks, you know, that that's super cool. Yeah, I actually, I actually really looking forward to playing the Triumph for Treachery. I have a lot of fun playing the four-player battles, and there'll be plenty of times where, like, um, you get to the games club and there's three people, um, and you, you feel guilty playing 1v1. And you're like, I want to include you somehow. Triumph for Treachery is a perfect way to bring in a third person and, and have some fun. And um, the dynamics of, as you mentioned, you know, we're all allies, but we're all enemies, so... Uh, how that swings throughout the game, um, and there's some really interesting rules with the the um, the has the Mortarks are vying for power. So it's not just you know one verse one verse one. There are some extra layers of spice to kind of bring that battle of Mortarks to life. So I'll let you all enjoy that when it comes out. Anything else? That's it. All um, right. I'm excited. All right. Well, I'll see you in about a week's time from this uh, being being sent out into the wilderness. Uh, I'll be at LVO, so you'll be at LVO. So come say hello to both of us. Is there anything else you want to shout out? Any friends? Any, any people want to talk to you? You are definitely on my Discord. You're probably on a lot of people's Discords, to be fair. Madigan, um, amazing person. Don't don't harass her too much about rules. I think everyone <laughs> everyone harass you about rules and. Uh, you are a part of the AOS FAQ team. Correct me if I'm wrong. I should have acknowledged that earlier. Thank you for your hard work. Thank you. But yeah, yeah. If anyone wants to come see me at El Mio, uh, I'll be there. You can find me. Um, I'm short, so it might be hard, but uh, I'm sure you'll manage. You're 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 playing good cop while uh, Tomo plays bad cop. Uh, a role that he is uh, really nailed down at this particular point. <laughs> All right, Maddie. Maddie, you are a legend. Uh, any shout outs? No. Shout out to Coach <laughs> for having me on a show. <laughs> no, look, um, look, when I got when I got this book for the first time, I had it for a couple more weeks and then I allowed you to see it. Um, when I read through it all, uh, I, I couldn't think of a better person who represented death. I absolutely had some people talking about one faction. But I thought who represented death the best, and you were definitely um, you were you were there. So um, I hope everyone, if you've listened to this and you've listened to two hours of goodness, holy crap, almost two and a half hours of goodness, um, you have some inspiration either to consider the regiment of renown or thinking about playing with the army of renown, or you have a better idea of why you're not going to play the army of renown. And if you do, you've now thought out the restrictions and some of the challenges you've got to work around in order to play with the Army of Renown or even Sekar or the regiments and which of the regiments. And it's a fun time. Pick it up, play, play, um, take it to your local store. I'm sure there'll be some new fun dynamic ways. And if you do want to support the channel and you want to buy it, buy it from my affiliate partners, Warpfire Minis in the USA uh, or Element Games uh, Australia, I will have something probably pretty soon if you want to help the channel and uh, it'll all go towards some pretty exciting things. Uh, I've got a, a gaming table being made as we speak. So uh, maybe in the second half of the year, battle reports may be on the card. So we'll we'll see how that plays out. And uh, yeah, who knows? Who knows? Who knows what the future holds, Maddie? What are you looking forward to for 2024? Um, I'm hoping to travel a lot uh, for Warhammer, I think. Um, I went to Worlds last year and it was great to, you know, meet everyone, um, see the country um, I'm going again this year. So it's always nice to see like just how many Warhammer players are out there. Um, everyone's like local metas and armies and stuff and how we all play, so. Yeah, it was uh, doing the videos, like doing um, the, the the world championships of Warhammer just gave me a new appreciation at a very global scale, right? You know, you hang out with your locals, you go to, you know, your big national tournaments, but very rarely do you go to international Warhammer and the likes of LVO, Adepticon do definitely bring it. But when you start seeing, you know, French, Poland, uh, Philippines, you know, all these countries, um, you do get a, you know, uh, it's much bigger than you know what we play and uh, it's pretty exciting and, and everyone's so nice like it's it's so lovely you all have For the sure. same thing yeah. love but 
All right, I'm rambling. I'm going to go have some lunch. Uh, Maddie, you're an absolute gem. Thank you for your discussion. If you enjoyed it, please make sure to press like. If there's something that you agree with or even disagree with, if you think we're not giving a Linda enough credit or maybe you think that Neferata has some particular spice in her army of renown, regiment of renown that uh, maybe we completely missed, let us know in the comment section. Tell us what we've missed. And if you want to talk more death, my Discord has lots of death players talking about death. They love their death. Uh, waiting for the rise of Nagash once again from the Black Pyramid. And, uh, yeah, who knows what's what's in store. Maddie, let's go. Let's have some lunch. And thank you, everyone, for your time. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, press like and all that stuff. Bye. Praise be Nagash. Thanks for hanging around until the end. I hope you enjoyed that video and you walked away with a few new ideas. Now, if you did, I would love it if you press like on the video, as well as left me a comment with your thoughts. The conversation will continue over on Discord and the link is down below in the episode description. I also want to give a massive shout out to the AOS Coach patrons and YouTube members who are supporting the channel and the growth that you're seeing here. So cheers, you are all bloody legends. And until next time, don't roll a double one on a spell cast.